appreciated. Welcome to the 2024 K-State Garden Hour webinar series. We are so glad you're here. This webinar series started in 2020 and has been a collaboration of the entire K-State Horticulture Extension team. Since the start of the program, we've reached over 62,000 gardeners just like you. We are pleased to continue offering the K-State Garden Hour series for free. If you have enjoyed these educational webinars, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to support this program. The link to donate can be found in the chat or on the K-State Garden Hour website. This webinar is hosted by Kansas State Research and Extension. My name is Abby Drought, and I'm the Food Crops Horticulture Agent in Cedric County, Kansas. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline. But most of all, we each have a love for educating and sharing important gardening, gardening topics. Before we get started, we do have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Please use the Q&A feature for questions related to the presentation. This is where we will look for questions at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. You should see a button along the bottom tab that says Q&A. Just click on that and you will be able to answer, we will be able to answer your questions. Today's webinar will be recorded and we will post it to our K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources related to each topic as well. If we share links through the chat, we will also link them on the website. Our website is also where you will have access to previous topics and upcoming topics in the 2024 series. Our moderators today are Pam Paulson and Kala Edwards, and they will be sharing information through the chat during the presentation. They will also help us facilitate the Q&A portion of the webinar. Today's topic is season extension in the vegetable garden. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Carrie Rivard. Please give us a few moments while we transition to the and share the presentation slides. All right, hello everyone. My name's Kerry Rivard, and I'm an extension specialist located at the Olathe Horticulture Research and Extension Center. Uh, we do have a pretty large master gardener presence uh, here at the OREC. We've got two gardens actually that they manage here on the property. Um, so if you ever get a chance, come and visit us. Uh, but we're gonna be talking today uh, mainly about season extension techniques. Uh, we've done quite a bit of research here at the OREC and around the state related to season extension and made mainly high tunnel production. Uh, I know that high tunnels aren't necessarily something that a home gardener can just pop up in their backyard for a bunch of different reasons. So what I thought we would do today is, you know, sort of go through some of the principles and the ideas behind season extension uh, and then talk about in the sort of the second half, some of the specific practices uh, that I think are very well adaptable uh, to the garden situation. So when we talk about season extension, um, you know, what we're really talking about in most cases is the use of microclimate modification. So, you know, we've seen gardeners for years have known we need to cover up our plants when there's a frost coming or when there's really cold weather. Um, and you can do that with fancy glass jars like these uh, or, we often use five gallon buckets around here. They're not quite as pretty, but they certainly get the job done. Um, but you know, keep in mind that there's lots of different things that we can do in order to modify the microclimate for any type of vegetable crop. And you know, here in this part of the country, we deal with such erratic and difficult climate conditions. You know, I oftentimes call this gardening uh, here in Kansas because. In order to be successful uh, growing vegetables, you typically have to carry out some of these techniques anyways, whether you're trying to season, uh, extend the season or not. So I've got a little participant participatory activity here. Uh, this is a picture from one of our research trials many moons ago. And I love this picture because our uh, technician here is one, wearing an awesome shirt that was kind of indicative of where he was in his life. Uh, but I thought, you know, just looking at this picture, um, maybe if you could put in the chat what some of the microclimate modifications are that you see uh, in this picture. And there are a whole bunch of them. So 
go ahead and put that in the chat as you see them. Uh, I'll start out first and say there's this lovely gable vent at the top of the screen there that's going to help ventilate that hot air out of the high tunnel. Let's see what other folks have to say. Sprinklers, we do use sprinklers to cool things off in the in the heat. Uh, we do have a double layer um, poly covered greenhouse. It's technically a high tunnel, but we can call it a greenhouse. So those two layers of poly actually um, provide a tiny bit of R value because there is a an air pocket in between them. Um, but they also cut down the light quite a bit. For each layer of light you get, you're going to knock down about 12% of the light. Uh, there aren't any heaters in, in high tunnels. These are typically passively um, cooled and heated. Um, hedge for wind mitigation. Those are actually tomatoes, believe it or not. That is not a hedge. Those are tomatoes um, grown in a California steak and weed. They're grafted tomatoes, so you can see they're doing very well, um, and they're quite vigorous. But technically, that's what those are, not actually a hedge. But you're right, a hedge would provide a nice a nice wind block. That's funny. Other people saw that as well, too. Let's see. So these were being grown in the soil, not hydroponically, but um, keep in mind that soil, it's its hard to tell in the picture, but before we built that high tunnel, we actually raised the, um, the grade about 18 inches. So the, the grade of that high tunnel is anywhere from 15 to 18 inches above the grade of the, the immediate soil around it. So it actually provides like a raised bed, um, which is going to help it warm up in the spring, and it's also going to help it drain. Um, the strings themselves are not a microclimate modification, but certainly the pruning that happens as a use of those strings is definitely modifying the microclimate. Uh, shade cloth protection, we did not have shade in that case for this research trial, but um, we probably would and should have used them. So you know, as you can see, there's a ton of examples of season extension techniques, microclimate modification that we do anytime we're growing vegetables. And, you know, I think I would argue that when we think sort of, you know, a little more broadly about how we define agriculture uh, versus, you know, how things grow out in the wild, uh, microclimate management is certainly one of the main tenets of agriculture, whether you're plowing the soil, pruning an apple tree, um, putting row cover over lettuce, uh, you're going to be managing the microclimate. And there's oftentimes things that we do in gardening um, affects the microclimate, and it's the reason that we do it, even though we don't realize that that's actually the case. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about microclimate modification and season extension. So <clears throat> just a few ways we can think about it. You know, what is that microclimate that's surrounding that plant that we're trying to grow? Um, obviously, uh, we think about things like temperature and humidity. Um, also, water is a big one, uh, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Water retains a lot of heat energy. It can also cool plants off, um, and it's important to recognize that there's a difference between free water and um, and non-free water. So free water is those that are not uh, bound up by chemistry, essentially. So if it hasn't been solubilized into something, it's just pure H2O. That's what you can think of when you think of free water. Um, wind is also a big one here in Kansas. That becomes really important and something that we're constantly battling, um, not only to help the plants grow, but also try and keep our season extension tr uh, structures from blowing away in the wind. And then an area we've done a lot of research in the past is looking at light, uh, not only quantity, but spectral quality as well, too, and understanding how the different um, types of light, um, in addition to the volume of light itself, affects not only the productivity of plants, but also the nutritional quality. So another concept that we like to think about whenever we're talking about season extension is the idea of thermal mass. And this applies itself to any building, but it certainly fits really well when we're talking about greenhouses um, and other structures like low tunnels uh, that we want to warm up a, a certain area or a microclimate. So the thermal mass is essentially <laughs> the, uh, the volume um, or the amount of heat that a structure can store. So you think about this high tunnel on the bottom left-hand corner, it's going to warm up during the day. It's going to get very hot. 
we're going to close, you know, imagine uh, if it were early in the spring, we would close that tunnel up towards the evening to try and retain that heat. And then over the course of the night, there's going to be a lot of heat that's lost from the soil that had been gained during the day. And the idea with high tunnels and low tunnels is we can trap that heat from the soil and keep it closer to the plants and essentially make this little bubble of warmth around those plants so that they can experience warmer nighttime temperatures and therefore be more successful, right? And there's been other folks, really innovative um, folks that have taken this same principle and applied it to greenhouse production. So this picture on the right, this is a uh, passive thermal greenhouse. This is one of our growing growers host farms. And what they do is they essentially have this greenhouse facing the direct south. So it gets strong sun uh, during the day. And these water barrels that are in the that line the back of the greenhouse actually absorb heat uh, during the day. And then at night, they put that heat back into the room and help keep it warm. Um, you may remember from your mechanics classes that water is one of the best absorbers and holders of water. It has a very high specific heat. And so it's able to hold that heat and retain it um, you know, over the course of the evening and then release that heat back into the greenhouse at night. And so, for example, in this case, uh, this grower has this um, south-facing passive thermal greenhouse. They don't use a furnace in it and they're able to keep it above, you know, 50 degrees at night. So one of the things we'd like to think about um, is trying to find ways to increase our thermal mass so that we can get through the nighttime temperatures quicker or, or more effectively, I should say. And also because uh, things with higher thermal mass are going to not heat up as quickly. And that becomes a challenge too. Anytime you're using season extension techniques is, you know, if you have a, a low tunnel or something out there in your garden, it's going to heat up really fast in the morning and you want to make sure you get it opened um, before that happens. Whereas something like a high tunnel, it's going to have a lot more thermal mass, takes a lot more heat energy to fill it up. And so therefore you have more time in the morning before you need to open it and ventilate it. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to touch on a little bit was light. Uh, I think most of us know that when we talk about light for crop growth, we're thinking about photosynthetic active radiation. So there's a certain band of light within the visible light spectrum that we call PAR, essentially. And it's responsible for enabling the machinery behind photosynthesis and promoting plant growth and those types of things. Um, but there are sometimes... Um, techniques that we use, especially if we're talking about shade cloth, uh, where you can actually um, cut out too much light on plants. And there's, you know, if you're using row cover, that's going to cut out light too. And so you have to be able to strike the balance between, um, you know, accomplishing the goal of that season extension technique that you're trying to reach, whether it's cooling the temperatures down, whether it's protecting them from frost, but also understanding that if you cut down too much light, you know, the plants need the sun, right? And so uh, we need to make sure uh, that they get everything they need. So the general rule of thumb, whenever we talk about season extension, is that we the idea is that you can typically put 30 days um, on each end of the growing season. And this is, you know, we talk about that mainly in the in the utilization of high tunnels. Um, but in general, you know, that's sort of, what the goal is. And, you know, especially here in Kansas, where we have very cold winter times, uh, you're not likely to extend the season much more than that. Now, there are examples where folks are able to accomplish that. So please, by all means, somebody uh, prove me wrong on that. Um, but in general, we're looking at extending the season 30 days in either direction when we're talking about warm season crops, right? And those are crops that we need to wait until after the last frost-free day to plant those. <clears throat> Uh, this is a picture from a research trial that we did uh, quite a while ago where we were manipulating planting dates to look at season extension in the tunnels in the open field. And what this picture shows is basically 28 days of growth for these tomatoes. So we planted the tunnels four weeks later, we planted the open field, but we also, in the name of science, um, planted a treatment in the tunnel as well. And so this is literally the growth um, that happened uh, during that season extension period. And it doesn't look like a lot, you know, those, you don't see any green fruit out there, um, but there's certain, there's certainly flowers in those plants that are hiding from us in the picture, but I'm sure there's clusters of flowers down within those leaves. And also think about how much root growth 
has set on that's going to help, you know, really increase the productivity of that plant. So, um, you know, this is sort of that physical exhibit of what that might look like. Now, with cool season crops, it gets a little bit trickier. Um, cool season crops, for one thing, have a much higher tolerance of cold weather. And so there are some examples of cool season crops where we can, you know, really extend the season for those quite a bit more. And I'll show you an example of how we do that here in a second. But for the most part, what we're trying to do is really increase the growth and the productivity of those plants during the crop establishment period. Um, in the spring, we have a big challenge in Kansas in that it gets hot really fast. So if we can get our stuff going earlier, um, then they'll be able to, you know, thrive and grow and be productive during the time of the, the year when they're supposed to do well. Um, if you plant spring crops late, what tends to happen is we start getting these really warm nighttime temperatures. And so lettuce will start to bolt. Um, broccoli will not form good heads. You know, all types of those things can happen. And so by getting them in nice and early, you can really give them that prime environmental condition that they like and appreciate um, when they're still, you know, young. The other thing that we can do with cool season crops is we can attempt to break winter dormancy. And this takes typically something a little bit more structured like a high tunnel um, than maybe say in low tunnels, um, but, it, but it can work very effectively. And we have a lot of growers who are able to do this. So if you think about what happens during the winter with a crop like lettuce or spinach, um, essentially at some point it's gonna get so cold and the days are so short that they will not grow whatsoever. Um, and in a high tunnel, most of the time, you're not able to completely break that winter dormancy. And that really is a function of the day length than it is uh, the temperature itself. But one of the things we've seen a lot of uh, growers in our area start to do um, is grow, grow their fall cool season crops into the winter and leave them within those season extension structures, whether it's a high tunnel or a low tunnel, and then actually harvest from those dormant plants during the winter time. So essentially your covered lettuce rows are really just serving as a big walking cooler for you out there in the garden. And they're holding those plants and protecting them from super cold weather and from pests and those types of things. Um, and then you can just go and harvest them as they're needed uh, in December and January. Uh, if you have time, there's a, a, a lot of really good information about how to do this in the Growing Undercover Guide, which is a, a season extension manual that I helped the Kansas Rural Center put out a few years ago. By and large, though, one of the big benefits for using season extension techniques here in Kansas is simply environmental protection. Whether you plant on time or whether you plant early, um, Kansas is a brutal place to try and grow vegetables. And between the wind and the heat and the cold and the storms and the hail, um, you know, it's very challenging oftentimes to grow uh, vegetables effectively in the garden. And so, you know, I really urge folks to play around with these techniques, not just with the goal of trying to plant earlier and plant later, but also just to protect your crops. So some examples of how we can provide environmental protection um, using some of these season extension techniques. One is is a big one and, and probably obvious to most folks, and that's protection from early and late frosts. So <clears throat> when people first started growing in tunnels, there was a lot of discussion amongst researchers that, you know, will there be a frost inside of a high tunnel? Is that possible? And, you know, we're, we're all great plant people. None of us are meteorologists. And so nobody really knew for a long time. Um, this picture I took here, at the, this is at the Olathe Horticulture Center, and this is one of our what we call three season high tunnels. And so you can see from this picture, this tunnel is totally open, the in walls, the side walls, um, and it was open overnight. And I drove down early one morning and sure enough, we had a big heavy frost everywhere except within that tunnel. And just to reiterate, that tunnel was not closed. There was no thermal protection being provided. Um, frost literally falls out of the air. And so if you can protect it, whether it's with plastic, like in this case, or row cover, um, then you can help prevent the damage that happens from that frost. And what a lot of people don't realize too is that um, the frost itself is oftentimes not terribly pro problematic on the plants. What happens is actually when the frost melts, um, the, the change in the temperature happens so quickly that it causes lyses the plant cell walls. And so 
Um, it's actually the warming process after the frost that's actually most damaging. When I was a kid, my folks had a greenhouse business. And one of the things we would do uh, is we had plants out on display racks out by the highway. Uh, and if we would get frosts overnight, we would actually go out early in the morning before the sun came up and wash the frost off the plants. And, you know, it sounds like a silly thing to do. And my hands were and feet were always cold when we did that. But um, it prevents that damage from that frost damage from happening, especially on colder hardy plants like pansies and lettuce. Um, and, you know, again, that can be a season extension technique in itself. The other thing to remember is that if you're you know, covering soil with row cover and especially in a high tunnel situation, soil almost never freezes uh, within the high tunnel. And as far as the plant perspective, that's a great thing. Um, as far as insect uh, management, that can be a bad thing, right? We do appreciate some freezing in the soil uh, to kill insect eggs. And so, you know, again, you, you want to think carefully about that. But um, because inside of these structures, like a high tunnel, um, the soil never gets to freezing temperatures. Those roots continue to main, remain viable. They can take up water. They can help support plant growth. So this is some data basically showing daily average temperature. And this is one of our tomato trials from long ago. Um, but what you can see is that the average temperatures oftentimes, and again, this is in a, in a high tunnel, um, will be quite a bit higher than um, the open field. And that's a function of not only the daytime temperatures, because it gets warmer within the tunnel with the sun comes up, but also the nighttime temperatures. It, they, they do not drop as low um, as they do um, within the open field. And similarly, when we start talking about minimum temperatures, you know, this is where uh, sort of the rubber hits the road because those minimum temperatures are when you start to see things like freeze damage and frost damage, right? Especially on warm season crops, that can be a big problem. Um, now, we obviously frost and freezing is a terrible thing, but when we're we're talking about warm season crops, the the magic number is typically 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what we like to keep the plants growing at at night, if possible. Um, now you may not have the option to keep it that high, but that's sort of the goal. Um, and part of the reason for that is because pollination can become an issue um, below those temperatures, as well as overall plant growth. But one of the things I really like to point out in this slide is you can see that the amount of thermal protection that's provided by this high tunnel changes on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, on this, this particular day, maybe it was six or seven degrees Fahrenheit. This day, it was almost 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you look here, it was just a couple of degrees, couple of degrees. Here's one that's very similar temperatures between the tunnel and the field. And the reason for that um, is because that thermal protection is a function of what the weather was like the day before. Keep in mind that, you know, again, we, we're trying to build up this thermal mass with a whole bunch of heat energy during the day. If it's real cloudy, you're going to have a lot of trouble being able to do that, right? So we need to think about the temperatures uh, the day before when we can try and predict um, the protection, the thermal protection that these processes can provide. Whoops, there we go. This is a little more recent data. This is from our a trial at, here at the OREC. And basically what we were doing is we, we had a um, variety trial planted uh, in one of our tunnels. And <clears throat> we had a very, very cold snap in about the second week of May. And so you can see outside the tunnel, it got down to 39 degrees, which is very cold for a tomato plant. They would survive that, but they would not be very happy about it. Um, where we did not use the row cover, and this row cover is what you see down the middle here, um, we got about 10 degrees of thermal protection. Um, where we did use the row cover um, without these hoops, uh, we got even more thermal protection, about 17 degrees. So that was our highest temperature was 56. So we were able to stay above that 55 line there, which is nice. Um, and then where the hoops were used, it was actually a little bit cooler. It was 53. So, you know, one of the best ways I've heard this explained uh, is like when you go camping, uh, you don't put a sleeping bag high over top of your body 
you wrap yourself up in it, right? Because it helps keep you warm that way. And in the same way, we, we've seen that row cover, if it's directly on the plants and more importantly, directly on the ground where it's the source of that heat, it's going to stay a little bit warmer than if you use those hoops. Um, however, the challenge becomes uh, if you put this row cover directly on, for example, these tomato plants, they were not very happy about it. You see how they're all wilty. Um, um, and again, these are young plants, right? Uh, the ones that were that had hoops around them, you can't really see very well in this picture, uh, but they were still very happy, turgid, upright, not wilting at all. So you need to be careful with row cover in general, especially if you're not using those hoops. It can warm up pretty quickly. Uh, in the morning, and, and you can have issues um, with them starting to sort of get suffocated. Uh, the last the last piece of sort of microclimate modification that we like to talk about is light manipulation. Um, and this is becoming a real area of you know, sort of the next black box and research for plant production and crop production is thinking about how we can manipulate light uh, in order to provide more nutritious crops and also increase yields. And this becomes important for high tunnel production. It's very important for greenhouse production these days. We're starting to see a lot more LEDs used in the production of food crops. Um, but in general, you know, keep in mind that when anytime you cover these plants with plastic, that plastic is not 100% clear, right? And there's also some plastics such as the, the luminance brand, uh, which will in fact diffuse light. Um, so this is a picture of what that looks like. This is from one of our research studies. Um, you can see how that diffuse uh, plastic on the left, it, it actually refracts the light, um, whereas standard plastic, uh, you know, is essentially more or less clear. Um, now, what it means when it refracts the light is it actually bends the light uh, waves themselves and, and points them into the tunnel. And so it's kind of interesting when we use tunnels like this with diffuse plastic, there's actually not a, <clears throat> not as strong of a shadow within the tunnel because the light is coming in from both sides. Um, because again, that diffuse plastic will actually refract the light and, and, and bring it inside of the structure. So I'm not gonna go into the details, but just to let you know, we've done uh, quite a bit of research uh, with faculty at the Olathe campus and also on the main campus looking at how that light spectral quality and quantity affects uh, plant growth and productivity as well as nutritional quality um, and other aspects of those crops. So UV, UV light in particular is really important for nutritional quality and the production of certain phytochemicals. Um, and they're oftentimes very impacted by growing uh, things under light, or sorry, under poly, excuse me. Uh, this this basically just shows the amount of photosynthesis that occurs in some of those um, <clears throat> underneath some of those different types of polyfilms. Uh, and one thing just to point out, and we'll come back to this later, look over here under the shade cloth. This is 55% shade cloth. Uh, you can see we're getting a lot less than 55% of PAR, which I find very interesting since they sold a shade cloth that said it was 55%. Um, but also that photosynthesis drops quite a bit um, once those plants are under shade cloth as well. And this is sort of, you know, the other thing that's interesting is as we manipulate light, it can have big impacts on um, plants and especially ones that are producing anthocyanins and other color pigments um, as, as part of their fruit or the head, in this case, of lettuce. Um, it's remarkable. <clears throat> You know, especially if we look at this row of red lettuce at the bottom, how many different types of poly and plastic can affect the prevalence of that red color in the red lettuce. And again, look at the, the shade cloth. Lettuce isn't even red. It's green, um, even though it's supposed to be. And, and look how dark um, red the open field lettuce is all the way to the right compared to all the other ones that are grown under poly. Okay, so let's talk about some of those uh, specific season extension practices. Um, the first and, you know, probably one most folks are already familiar with is the use of floating row covers. Uh, floating row covers um, are often called Agribon or Agritech. There's a bunch of different trade names out there. Um, but essentially, these are spun bonded polyester 
um, cloths that protect crops from frost and freezing. And they do provide a, a tiny little bit of R value so they can actually help hold in uh, that heat at night. The other thing that's nice about floating row covers, especially compared to plastic itself, is it's typically white. And so it's actually going to reflect um, the sun during the day and it's gonna help that from getting too hot. Uh, in addition, because it's a polyester um, fabric, it's able to breathe to some degree, certainly a lot more than plastic is. And so, you know, again, you can have issues with plants if, they, if they're underneath that row cover for too long and they're not covered or they don't have support um, with wire hoops, then we can have some issues. But for the most part, they allow the plants to breathe underneath of the row cover. And generally speaking, you can put row cover right on top of the crops. Uh, something else just to point out, a lot of folks use row covers for pest management during the summer. Um, this, if you grow organic squash in this part of the country, uh, pretty much the only way you can do that is by covering those squash with row cover just to keep the insects off of them. Now, usually for pest management, we wanna use the lightest row cover we can find, the 0.5 ounce per yard. Whereas during the winter time, we might wanna use the heavier row cover, the one or the 1 1.2 ounce per yard. So there could be some differences. You may not be able to double dip there, but you can certainly um, think about how you would do that both in the summertime and the wintertime. So this is just a picture from <clears throat> I'm one of those people that will plant vegetables in my front yard uh, as long as the neighbors don't complain too much. Uh, so this was some lettuce I had, just some baby lettuce that was grown. Um, and then you can see there's some, some wire hoops here. Um, this is basically just number nine uh, wire that you can buy some tractor supply or any other farm supply store, um, or nine gauge, I should say. You can't tell in this picture, but there's actually a little bit of netting put across these hoops. And, and part of the reason those hoops are there is for the netting. We have a lot of rabbits in this neighborhood, and so I didn't want them to eat my arugula. Um, but you can see, essentially, we just take that row cover when there's a cold night, throw it on top, make sure you have something to weigh it down so it doesn't blow away, um, and you're pretty much good to go. And you can imagine, again, over the course of the evening, uh, there's going to be warmth in the soil that's going to be trapped by that row cover, and it's going to help those plants grow. Now, here you can see uh, that same plot um, in the wintertime. Uh, with snow. This is another reason it's good to use supports or wire supports underneath of that row cover is because if it snows on top of row cover that's directly on top of plants, that can be a problem um, because the weight itself uh, will suffocate the plants. So again, it's a, it's a good idea to use wire hoops um, <clears throat> or if you don't have hoops available, actually just pull the row cover off when it's going to snow, because snow itself is a great insulator, uh, and so you can you can also you know approach it that way. We've done quite a bit of research with strawberry growers in Kansas um, that use row cover extensively. Here you can see several acres being covered with row cover, and obviously this is a much grander scale than we do at home. But you know, I just wanted to let you know that this is this is happening pretty commonly around our state. Um, during the winter for strawberries, we'll put row cover on in the middle of December, around the 20th or so, or maybe the beginning of December. Um, and then that row cover will stay on the entire winter and essentially will be taken off somewhere between February 15th and March 15th uh, to sort of wake those berries back up. Um, but, you know, you can you can use it on very large expanses, even in the windy conditions of Kansas. You just have to make sure you, you know, these are rock bags that are holding it down in this case. Um, and so that can be a really helpful thing to have around. Now, in this case, uh, this was a research trial, and I just wanted to point out some of this data because I find it really amazing, quite frankly. Um, if you look here, right around the 1st of January, it was down at 5 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and underneath of those row covers, it was still somewhere in the neighborhood of 26 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is a huge temperature difference that you see. You know, when we get these big spikes, um, you know, we get these polar blasts that move in from the north, uh, that row cover can be really helpful for preventing 
those really drastic temperatures from affecting the plants. And one of the outcomes that we had from this research that we found is that we actually preferred the heavier row cover, which in this case was 1.2 ounces per yard, but it wasn't actually because it provided more um, cold protection. Um, the, the we did get a we did see some small differences uh, in the temperatures when it got cold. But what became more important is when we'd get really warm days in January, that 1.2 ounce uh, row cover would actually. Um, help keep the plants dormant and keep them from waking up too early. Um, because again, that thicker row cover is just going to moderate that temperature. Okay, so <clears throat> we've done talking about how we can warm things up. Let's talk about how we can cool things off. Um, cool season crops, especially in the fall, you know, do really well in Kansas, but getting them established and through the transplant stage can be really challenging. So um, shade cloth can be really helpful for this. Uh, anywhere from 30% to 55% shade is what I've seen folks use. Uh, this is a very small sort of a, a micro farmer uh, that I work with quite a bit here in KCK. And you can you can see basically she, she uses shade cloth extensively for her fall crops and, and continues to do this now on her bigger farm. Um, but this is a real simple, just PVC frame structure some shade cloth thrown over top. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily anything real fancy. Now, one of the things we have learned, um, this is a, a gardener that I, I knew that's over on the Missouri side, so we can, you know, take some lessons from them, is that if you put shade cloth directly on fruits, for example, cantaloupes, um, it will burn those fruit. The, the black plastic netting gets extremely hot. And so you have to find some way to levitate that shade cloth above the plants. Uh, in this case, you can see he actually stacked some crates to kind of hold it up. And in the areas around those crates didn't have any problems. But these places where the shade cloth touched the cantaloupe, it was a big, big problem. <clears throat> uh, and this was this is actually a really old slide from my predecessor. Um, but I, I still find it very relevant because I see a lot of folks doing this still today. Um, is the production of summer greens with shade cloth. And so in this case, you can see um, this is with spinach and you, this is um, spinach here on the right in the tunnel with shade cloth compared to on the left where it basically just doesn't exist in the open field. Um, but I, I know a lot of growers that are now growing lettuce almost through the entire summer under shade cloth. Um, there's other crops as well. We actually have been doing a bunch of research lately with day neutral strawberries where we grow them under shade cloth uh, for, for several years now and you know strawberries aren't something we typically think of as being a summer crop here in Kansas they're more spring or a fall crop so there are ways you can grow cool season plants in the summertime with shade cloth um, but you know one of the things to keep in mind is this this technique is going to be a lot more effective for things like spinach and things like lettuce that are leafy greens uh, compared to like fruiting vegetables um, or root vegetables in particular. Root vegetables need a lot of light so that they can produce so much photosynthate that they start sending those sugars to their roots in order to grow sweet potatoes or whatever it is that you're you're growing or carrots. Um, but leafy greens, they don't necessarily need as much light as other types of plants in order to just grow and be successful. And so that's a good place to start if you're trying to grow things under shade cloth. And then, you know, sort of related to it, a product that we've actually used quite a bit, especially for our trials um, down in the Wichita area, is this kaolin clay product. So it's 100% organic. It's, it's literally clay that has been um, pummeled down into something that's a wettable powder. And then essentially you put it in a typical pesticide sprayer and spray it on the plants. You can spray it on the fruit. Um, it was originally designed for use in Florida to prevent insects from attacking plants and being uh, organic insect management practice. But what they learned real fast is that that shading um, compound itself uh, actually helps the plants from getting too hot. And so it can be really effective uh, and also provide some protection from wind as well, too. The one thing you have to be careful about with using uh, kaolin clay is that the minute it rains, 
it's going to wash that stuff off. And so if you're in a real rainy part of the year, you may have to put a lot of applications out. Um, I So before we finish talking about using shade cloth and shading compounds, I just wanted to point out, you know, a little bit of the research that we've done has basically shown that you can drastically reduce your yield um, by using shade cloth. And again, this was that, that graph I showed you earlier with 55% shade, um, but we had, you know, about two thirds the yield um, with the treatments that, that had 55% shade compared to all the rest of them. So, you know, you've got to, again, be careful, and especially with fruiting vegetables or root vegetables, with how much shade you provide. And, you know, one of the things I recommend to our farmers in the area, a lot of our growers like to put shade cloth on their tunnels for tomatoes. Um, and what, what I really encourage folks to do is don't put that shade cloth on until after that first harvest and after they've started to really, um, you know, blush and turn red, because that shade cloth is really protecting those fruit from getting, um, you know, sun scald essentially. And so you're not going to have that issue when you have green fruit, but you could potentially reduce the yield. There's lots of things we can do to help protect from wind as well. This is kind of a fun one. I, I old man taught me here where we actually would take one gallon nursery containers and then put that down around plants, especially right after they're planted and while they're getting established. These are, um, in this case, these are Brussels sprout transplants and Brussels sprouts to grow them in the fall, um, you have to plant them about July 15th. And in order to survive July 15th with a cool season crop, um, these little nursery containers actually work really well. And we've done that quite a bit um, in the past. This is another effect, fun technique you can do with cover crops. So um, these, this is, this is ryegrass uh, mixed with vetch. Um, and then essentially what we did was we just mowed a strip through it and did what you would call sort of strip tillage and planted our squash through there. And the main purpose of that was really just to protect those plants from that early spring wind. And especially if you've got squash transplants, you know, they're so leggy and they get real soft real quick. And so it's going to help them go through that um, process that they need to, you know, get ready for real life out in the field. Um, storm protection, you know, this is one of the things that hits gardeners and farmers every year in Kansas is we get a big hailstorm and it wipes out thousands of dollars of hail of lettuce um, and other leafy greens in general um, because hail is just super damaging. And so, you know, oftentimes we'll use low tunnels, high tunnels, row cover, any of those type of things, anything you can do to cover those plants um, to prevent, you know, that hail damage can be really helpful. Okay, so a little bit about low tunnels and the way we basically define low tunnels is those are tunnels that we are not able to walk underneath of, whereas a high tunnel we can. Um, we typically can just use a hoop, whether it's, you know, that um, nine gauge wire, these are PVC hoops, you can even buy benders um, in order to put those on. Um, these, this is a, a low tunnel kit you can buy from some of the seed companies. And, you know, again, you can see this has a very thermal mat, a uh, small thermal mass, so it's gonna warm up really quickly. Um, and you'll have to vent those things very quickly in the morning before it gets too hot. Uh, here's some low tunnels within a high tunnel. And, you know, it's amazing what you can do when you start double tunneling things. Uh, here you can see this is a movable low tunnel. This is out here at the research station. So this was kind of fun. One of our apprentices built this. Um, and essentially, this is EMT conduit uh, that he used a bender to make those hoops. Um, PVC pipe here, and then this is a roping system that we use for our high tunnels to help hold down the plastic. And it works really well because as when you pull that plastic up on the sides, uh, it will hold it in place for you, which is really nice until it rains, of course. Um, and so that can be a really effective technique. And it's more or less just like a shoelace uh, across the ends of the tunnels. Uh, just to kind of wrap things up, I wanted to point out a little bit about high tunnels. I know that they're not quite as relevant for home gardening, but um, caterpillar tunnels in particular, I think can be really useful if you're interested in dabbling in sort of small scale tunnel production. Um, typically with high tunnels, we think about them looking something like this in this picture. They have roll up sides, um, got gable vents, so you can get a lot of ventilation through those things during the summer. 
And, you know, one of the nice things about growing in a tunnel is it really gives you the ability to integrate all of these season extension techniques together. And so you can see the effects. This are some research trials we had um, where, you know, essentially what we see is during a bad tomato year, uh, even in the tunnel, we still do pretty good. Um, whereas in the open field, you can have complete crop loss. So if you're in a home gardening situation, your tunnels may look a little different than ours. I, I really love this picture. This is from Reno County. Uh, this is an old friend of mine. Uh, who You can see he was experimenting with a bunch of different stuff in the tunnel. He's got zucchini over here on the left, um, cabbage. Um, tomato have been interplanted into the cabbage for after when they harvest. There's carrots over here on the right. So a lot of diversity. Um, and again, you know, I think something that might look a little more like a home garden. Uh, this is at a school garden in Emporia, and here you can see they've used raised beds, which are kind of fun, um, again, to help increase the temperature of the soils and, and further, um, you know, increase that season extension. Uh, this is a picture from our research station. Look how much snow has piled up on the outside of the tunnel um, here. You know, spinach are one of those things we can plant in a tunnel in the fall and it will overwinter in that tunnel. And it's amazing how this plant grows, even in very, very, very cold temperatures inside of that tunnel, just having that protection from the frost and a little bit of thermal protection from the row cover. So just to wrap things up, I wanted to show you all how these caterpillar tunnels work. These are homemade high tunnels, although you can buy them as a kit now, but they're essentially made from top railing of fencing. Uh, as you can see here, and this is when we actually got our, our top rail in. Um, and then we turned all that top rail into 430 foot long, 12 foot wide tunnels. So essentially you use this bender and make a 12 foot wide hoop and you can put as many hoops out as you want, more or less at any spacing that you'd like to. So they're nice for home gardeners or if you're just wanting something small because you can make yourself a 12 foot by 24 foot high tunnel if that's what you like. So this is a, whoops. This is actually us building the fourth one. You can see the other three on the left here. Um, essentially there's um, footers, which we use uh, top rail for that to get pounded into the ground. There's a baseboard that goes along there. Um, and then we throw all the hoops in. Uh, we put a purlin down the middle. So, whoops, you can see happening there. Uh, and then we went through and put all the hip boards along the side and that's gonna be used to hold the plastic down. Oh, here comes the purlin down the middle. And then the hit boards are next. So it's fun having a lot of graduate students around. We, we have lots of fun out here. And you can build a high tunnel in a single day if you're well organized and have already built three so you know what you're doing. So here's what those tunnels look like when they were done. And, it, <clears throat> and again, this tunnel could be any length you wanted it to. So it'd be really handy in a home garden situation. Uh, we had roll up sidewalls just like we do with our big tunnels. We had to make sort of temporary in walls for those, although I think if you made one yourself, you could make a permanent one. And here's a picture of one of the kits. So these are from a company called Farmer's Friend, and they'll actually ship you um, the hoops already bent, so you don't have to bend them yourselves, which is pretty handy. So just to kind of wrap things up, you know, again, in our region, season extension is more than just extending the season by 30 days. It's really as much about environmental protection as anything. Um, it's really difficult to grow vegetable crops in the Midwest with the wind and the storms. And so, you know, using these techniques are not only beneficial to extend that season, but also just for successful gardening. Those larger structures are going to have a higher thermal mass. So we always want to keep that in mind. It's going to allow them to hold more heat at night, and it's going to allow them to warm up slower so you prevent crop damage. You know, you think about this little collage down here, how quickly would that thing get extremely hot in the morning um, before that has to be taken off. Um, air temperature is important. Soil temperature is really important. And, you know, in terms of plant growth, it's always good to keep this in mind. And we're always trying to warm the soil um, in different ways using season extension techniques or microclimate modification techniques. And one thing I did not touch on very much detail is that there are varieties of crops out there specifically for season extension. So things like parthenocarpic cucumbers, um, things like tomatoes that flower earlier. Um, there are varieties out there that have been bred by the seed companies specifically for the use of season extension. So utilize those when you have the opportunity. 
and be prepared to chase a large piece of plastic or fabric around. We love doing that here. All right, it looks like I went over by a couple minutes, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that are available. All right, we have a few questions. Um, one of the questions is, how is pollination accomplished in the, the high tunnels, especially if you've got all the sides enclosed? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, first of all, you it would be very atypical that you're not opening that tunnel at some point during the day. You know, once you get sun, um, you're going to have to open the tunnel even on very cold days. So, you know, you're still going to be able to get pollinators within there. Um, and they will find their way into the tunnels. But one of the things we encourage folks to do in tunnels, as I mentioned a minute ago, is like with cucurbits where they have to be pollinated, use those parthenocarpic varieties so that they're essentially, that means they're self-pollinating. Many other crops like tomatoes are wind pollinated. So it's really not a big problem. And you can actually go out there and, you know, promote pollination yourself by smacking them around with a broom or use, use a hand pollinator. Okay. Um, one of the questions was, um, they just finished building a greenhouse and they're wanting to use the water filled barrels. Um, is freezing a concern or, and recommendations on how to mitigate freezing? You know, that's a great question. I don't think it would be a concern as long as they weren't overly full. I think you just want to leave a little bit of headspace for that um, water to get a little bit bigger as it freezes. Um, but all the cases where I've seen people use barrels of water that doesn't seem to cause an issue, a headache for them. I, I, I would think in some cases you will have freezing water when it gets really, really cold. If it's, you know, when the sun disappears for four or five days at a time, which can happen here in the winter, um, that could that could certainly happen. But I don't think you know, it's not under any pressure, so it shouldn't crack those barrels. I think it'd be okay. Okay. Um, do you use thermometers that show both the high and the low temperature in your trials or in your high tunnels? We do, yep. Yeah. So yeah, oftentimes I didn't show any of that data here, but we will report high temps as well as low temps. Okay. What does PAR stand for? Photosynthetic active radiation. So that's the band of light within the visible spectrum of light that actually um, energizes the photosynthetic process within plants. Okay. Um, so this one has a couple questions. Um, is the diffusion plastic the same as white plastic? It is not. That is a great question. Um, diff diffuse plastic uh, literally refracts the light as it's coming in. So it looks milky uh, like white plastic might, but it's it's not the same. And white plastic is gonna be opaque. Um, we haven't ever tried growing things um, under white plastic, but I'm sure it would cut a lot more light out than diffuse plastic would. Okay. Um, this um, person, their son put up a high tunnel last summer and a snowstorm flattened the roof. Yeah. What could they do to prevent that in the future? So, yeah, this is a, a good question. Um, many of our high tunnel growers actually will go out there and clear snow when there's snowstorms. Uh, we we have to do it here at the research station um, because snow can flatten a tunnel really quickly. Now, that being said, there's things that you can do to to try and prevent that. So there's different shapes of high tunnels there's what they call the gothic arch which is like a peaked triangle mm -hmm. arch and then there's the quonset arch which is a half circle those gothic arch structures are going to shed snow much better because they have a more of a pitched up um, you know angle for that snow to run off so in kansas i i really recommend folks to get the gothic arch tunnels if they can um, and they're typically a little more expensive, but they're they're definitely more stout against the wind and certainly better against the snow. Um, the other thing to be careful about is I've seen growers leave shade cloth on their tunnels just because it's the end of the year and they're just, you know, don't have time to do it. And shade cloth sticks, you know, snow sticks to shade cloth. It cannot shed off of it. And so that's another great way to smash a high tunnel is leave shade cloth on it during the wintertime. Okay, so this person, so you get higher yields 
Um, but what is the net addition to profit after you pay for the plastic and the other materials? Yeah, for I mean, you know, so the, the the wonderful and terrible thing about economics related questions is you can always answer them with it depends. Um, there's it, there's a lot of factors. There are high tunnels out there that cost, you know, for a say a 20 by 72 foot tunnel, anywhere from $2,000 to $10,000. So it really depends on how much you spend on the structure itself, um, what crop you're growing, what price you're selling it at. It's all going to change. Um, that being said, for most of our more high value crops, things like tomatoes, things like cucumbers, um, plants that uh, put a lot of produce on per square foot, they typically end up working out fine on the economics. And that's that's one of the reasons why we've seen just this huge increase in the amount of tunnel production here in the Midwest is because growers are getting their hands on them. And pretty soon, once they've grown in one for one year, they're buying two more the next year because they, they tend to pay for themselves pretty quickly. Okay. Um, two more questions. Um, so this individual has tried seeding um, cool season crops like lettuce, spinach, kale around mid-August mm -hmm. with little to no germination. Is it still too hot or any ideas on what they might be doing wrong? So, yeah, those those crops really like to have soil temperatures below 60, if you can, for germination or in that neighborhood. And during the summer, there's just no way you can do that. So... What we do actually around here, um, like for example, we're, we just planted a bunch of spinach for our fall trials and spinach is extremely sensitive to high soil temperatures. It doesn't germinate well. We will actually germinate it inside. We germinate it in our office building. The minute it pops, we, we put it outside because the plant itself can take the heat, but they just don't like the germination. So you need to get a little bit creative you know, to, to get them to germinate. And then once they've germinated, they'll be fine. Okay. And our last question, um, I think this was referring to when you're talking about the diffuse plastic, um, but refracted light in a tunnel can assist plants with excessive heat. Yeah. So one of the things the industry folks will tell you is that that diffuse plastic actually keeps it cooler inside the tunnel than the other plastic types. Um, we... I'd have to go back and look in those publications. I don't remember seeing a strong trend of that um, in Kelly's trials, but I, I'd have to go back and look. We do have that data available. All right. That is all the questions that I have for you. All right. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for hosting this to the K-State team. Thank you, Dr. Avar, for presenting today and Pam Paulson and Kala Edwards for moderating the chats today. We typically have more questions than we have time for, but we will be sure to link several articles related to this session on our website. We hope these resources will help answer your questions, but if you need additional information, contact your local K-State Extension Office. Once again, we thank you for joining our K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We are so glad you could be here today to learn about season extension in the vegetable garden. We are excited to continue offering this webinar series in 2024. Be watching your email for more details coming soon. You can visit the K-State Garden Hour website to view our recorded Garden Hour archive or to make a tax-deductible donation to support the continuation of this webinar series. This session was recorded and will be posted on the website by tomorrow afternoon. After this webinar ends today, we will receive you will receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Thank you. We hope you continue to tune in for the first Wednesday of each month and have a great week.